Hey now, welcome back to another episode of Relative Run Readiness. As always, I'm your hostess with the mostest, Matt Pandola, with my assistant. <laughs> Shut your mouth, <laughs> assistant. My, my, uh, Robin. No, wrong again. I'm Matt Man. Try, try again. If you've been listening for any amount of time to our podcast, you'll know that Chad does not like being called Robin or my assistant, and that's exactly why I'll continue to call him <laughs> that. So we're we're talking today about overrated and underrated topics. This is something that I actually <laughs> took from Joe D. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk about Joe DeFranco a little bit. I want to hear more about Joe DeFranco. Now, uh, Joe DeFranco... For those of you listening, if you don't know who he is, you know, shame on you. Shame. Shame, on you. shame. shame. No, Joe is um, somebody that I have been listening to for years now with his podcast, The Industrial Strength Show. Great podcast if you are kind of in, uh, a little bit more interested in how we move iron better. And he he kind of talks about how he's a bit of a meathead but there's so much valuable information in there. He's he's far from a meathead. He's a he's a guy that loves strength. He's very passionate about strength training, and for good reason. He has a lot of world class athletes that have come out of his facility over the years, and I personally have gained a lot of valuable information from listening to Joe. So, so I got to talk to him yesterday over zoom and it was um for me that was it's it was a real surreal type of moment um i was quite nervous actually talking to joe because i respect him so much and i have talked to him in the past before briefly in person but but not uh in depth like like yesterday's conversation so it was it was awesome talking to him and we we talked a little bit about his podcast and he took the idea of overrated underrated that topic from uh, another guy called Gary V and so giving credit to Gary V and Joe D we are going to talk about overrated underrated because nice. everybody's been really excited about um uh, well, mailing in their questions, but we don't really mail it in anymore, Ma- do we? <laughs> mailing in their questions. I know. I know. I'm so... <laughs> you just aged yourself. I am aged. And, and that's another thing that, quite honestly, Joe and I talked about because with... I understand that social media, it's it's important to keep up with things and the times. But um, as a coach, um, I, I always learned that you, you're not, you shouldn't be on your phone when you're working with clients. And I've done brick and mortar for so many years that I never really developed the habit to be on my phone at all. And because I worked so many hours out on the floor, then I think that's part partially why I, I, I remember people were texting for a good couple years. And then finally, my clients started giving me a really a hard time, but not in a good way, because <laughs> I didn't even have a texting. I didn't even know how to do it. I didn't have a phone that texted yet, I don't think. And like, man, you got to get with the times I was trying to tell you. I was trying to ask if I could uh, switch over, um, go on a different day or if I could do that. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm still, you know, waiting for them to actually communicate that in person. So at the time I was saying, well, why don't you just, um, stick to, stick to your schedule. When you come in, you tell me you want something different, right? Uh Um, and there's of course good and bad to, to the convenience of, um, texting and things like this. I think that it means that, it's funny to me if somebody says, I'm going to uh, be in at eight o'clock and then some people want to confirm it with you. Um, eight o'clock tomorrow? Well, yeah, that's what's in the schedule. And, you know, and that's where I think sometimes we, we get things more complicated. But of course, part of what happened there, I had a lot of people trying to text me last minute can I come at a different time now? Can I, you know, and I no, don't know. I don't like, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I've got a schedule to keep and et cetera, et cetera. But you get like, where who I'm does that from. to a doctor. Like when's the last time you texted your dentist and said, Hey, can I move my appointment to four o'clock today? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and clearly I'm, I'm not a doctor, although I do write like one. 
<laughs> but but yeah, exactly. There's there's some courtesies, and and we're yeah. going to talk about courtesy a little bit first. Some courtesies there that I think look don't last minute. Is it really an emergency? Because I think that, that people have a lot of emergencies all of a sudden in their lives um, when it's just not convenient yeah. to stick to the schedule. Well, I, th- I think people mistake flexibility with emergency or flexibility with, you know, this this entitlement to say, you know what, I just don't feel like doing something or like it would be maybe more convenient to do something else, do it at a different time. And that flexibility in emergency situations is brilliant and wonderful and lovely. But when you're just trying to plan your normal every day, I think it just gets in the way. Yeah, that's right. And I I do my best to try to over deliver in everything that I'm doing. I believe I do that for the most part. But that's when, again, I might spend, I don't like look at a session when I'm with somebody as being on the minute, 60 minutes are up, we're done. I'll see you next time. You've never ended a session in 60 minutes. Probably never. Probably never. never. So I already in my schedule, I'm blocking out plenty of time to work with somebody if something comes up and we need a little extra time. I've just always put in that extra time with that person. I don't charge extra for that. It's just something that I believe helps with the process and helps future clients. So I try to look at it that way. But then... There is almost an expectation at a certain point that um, I'm going to have this extra time with you every time, right? And and that's where it gets a little bit more uh, difficult when it comes to what we talk about what is uh, courteous, right? Or what is um, acceptable and what ranges are we kind of operating in that we find acceptable now or or are we really thinking about the other person's time are we respecting that other person's time or are we respecting that other person period so i'm going to go on a little running rant here Uh oh oh i think we just came up with running rant running rant that will be a topic that we can talk about on the podcast yeah it's a section of the podcast now running rant running rant running rant number one what is your running rant so this is um i was out just i was running on the trails the other day and well Almost all my running is done on the trails. One, I have a beautiful lab named Lily. And if I don't get... (laughs) I thought you were like talking about a lab in your basement. (laughs) (laughs) That's a different kind of lab. Yeah, you wear Uh, a That's a performance enhancement lab. We'll uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, No, no, no. I don't don't do that. Yellow lab. Yeah, yellow lab. And if, if I... If I don't take her running in the mountains at least a few times a week, she starts getting upset. And by upset, I mean she will she'll poop somewhere she shouldn't, and she's that's letting what, me know. That's what you do too. Uh, yeah. If you don't get out enough, <laughs> I, yeah. So so I like to uh, I like to avoid um, the misbehavior, get her on her runs, and she's happy, and everybody's happy. So <clears throat> so we try to get out there. Generally, I'd say I, I get out there probably at least four days a week, and so I'm all. Also looking at doing some trail races coming up. So trails are getting busy is my point. And I don't know if you've noticed that, Chad, how busy the trails are now versus uh, a year ago before before COVID. I, you know, I don't know that I had a, uh, uh, the only thing I really have a lot to compare it to is, is years ago when I spent a lot of time trail running. Um we uh there weren't very many generally speaking you know unless it was like a sunday morning and then it was like there were runners and there were bikers and there were strollers and dogs and all that stuff and and it was all beautiful and great and wonderful but we uh melissa and myself and our uh one of our daughters uh penelope we w- tried to go out and our dog steven we tried to go out for a walk on the ditch trail uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, maybe a little bit more. And, uh, we got out, uh, near Horseman's Park there and we got out and, uh, it got real muddy real quick and, um, bikers started zooming by like all of them. I don't know how many bikers there, there were, but they were a lot. And 
Um, PK started, Penelope started to, um, lose her mind. She didn't want to walk anymore. And, um, Steve, uh, Steven had some bathroom problems and, uh, it was a, it was a hot mess. So that's the, that's the closest thing I've got. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to see that people are out on the trails more. That's, yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, I love that there's an outlet that's called, the outdoors. Yeah. That a lot of people, I think, were doing a lot more indoors. They were, I, I've had a facility for 20 years, but I've always told people that what you're doing in here, the goal is to enhance or enable you, your capacities to do the things that you love outside, outside of here, but mainly outside, right? Because there's, there's a lot of, support and evidence around how important it is for for our overall happiness that we get out in the nature in the wilderness um you know even just seeing the different colors and uh just kind of this the softer side if you look at um you know downtown it's exciting it's it's fun to walk around downtown but there's a um it's a different perspective on on um, the mind and our mind is busier, if you will. Um, when we go out in nature and we're enjoying that and the, the features are softer, the colors uh, get our, our minds working in a little bit more, I think, imagination and, and uh, we start to almost meditate more when we're out on a nice walk in the wilderness, things like that. So I love to see that people are finding their fitness outside and in the mountains and in the trails. But now I'm going to talk about what upsets me. Here comes the rant. Right. Here comes the rant because I believe in sharing the trails, okay? And so that means that when I'm I'm running and there's the ditch trail that you mentioned before is a pretty wide trail. And I'm running along the ditch. And of course, we're trying to COVID. You're still trying to keep six feet, going around people, things like that. Well, people will walk across the width of the trail and there'll be maybe three three people maybe uh friends or family or something or four people and they're blocking the entire trail you can't pass them until you have to ask them if they can move over so you can pass and so when you're trying to run a certain pace especially mm-hmm. it can be it can be tough uh to work around people like that and you know sometimes I'll get I'm sorry but I'm thinking to myself, well, you know that people are going to to pass pass you. They're going to come behind you at some point, and the trails are getting quite busy, so it's got to happen often enough. I would think that you well, would even think about not that. even just behind them, but towards them too. And you think how many times they got to move over for for people coming at them? You think they just scoot over, just stick one behind or two behind or something like that, and instead of four abreast, do two right. And uh, by the way, it also can be a bit of a safety thing, especially when people are on their bikes and they're coming fast, right? Yeah, for sure. And they're taking a a hard turn and they don't necessarily see you right away. And then all of a sudden you're right there in the middle of the trail, right? So just things to, to think about. But you mentioned coming towards people. Here's part two of my of my rant. When I run past people, I always wave. Actually, in either direction, but especially when I'm running towards you and I wave the other day, I must have passed at least somewhere around 40 people. It was a really nice day. So more people were out than normal. And I run pretty remotely in a lot of the mountain ranges I go into. But to get back to the truck within a mile of where everybody parks, that's when it's always a lot more congested, right? So anyways, I'm passing all these people and I counted three people wave back to me or just gave me a nod, like three people out of everybody I passed, which was around 40 people. Yeah. And I just wonder why that is. I'm not really sure why that is, but I would just say, I guess, I don't know. Do you, do you have a thought on that? Why don't people wave back? I, I find it, it might to be, be just rude. you. My, yeah, just because I'm intimidating. You are very yeah. intimidating. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, 
uh, it's so hard to say what the hell is going on in uh, people's minds most of the time, let alone like where we are right now in our, our new normal. But I remember when I moved here and I'm originally from the East coast like you. And, and when my wife moved here separately of me, cause we didn't know each other yet. And she's also from the East coast. Um, you know, she commented on how strange it was that how many people said hello to you. Um, you know, and she's from New Jersey, and if someone you don't know says hello to you, you punch them. Oh my! That's God. what oh, you do in New Jersey. I got a quick little <laughs> New Jersey story. I was um, back when we were in AmeriCorps, so the National Civilian Community Corps. We were doing some projects, and we went through New Jersey at the time. And we, I, you know, this is guy. You got to remember, guys, about geez, I don't know, to over twenty five years ago or something. About that, yeah. And so we didn't have, uh, you know, our smartphones and you just had a map and it gets quite confusing with all the, the turnpike mm-hmm. if you've ever been through New Jersey and every time you, you get off the highway at the wrong, you got to pay the toll and you got to, so I was, I pulled over at a gas station along the turnpike so I didn't have to get off, but I didn't really know where I was going. I was looking for this project site. And so I just asked somebody directions and he's like do i look like a map to you you know that's kind of like new jersey right that's kind of back east in general uh-huh, um, uh-huh. i kind of when i moved out west it's like oh people are so nice and yeah. uh, and you know in general don't get me wrong i know that uh, people are but it reminds me of S- smile when you are passing people i tell kids this in school if if you pass somebody in the hallway and you smile at them, see how many people smile back because you'll have a lot more people smiling back at you because it's just kind of a reflex, right? And and then they probably think, oh, that was, you know, that person is nice. And then maybe the next time you see them, they'll be the first one to smile or they'll start talking to you or whatever. And it just yeah. opens up the door a little bit. So, so I don't well, know. I mean, maybe, maybe, um, you know, this is just because you're running by and it's quicker and you're just giving a quick wave. Yeah. But I've thought about that before too, is, um, you know, it's good to smile when you're running, it relaxes you. Right. So, uh, smile when you pass people in and, and just, um, give a quick wave or a quick hello. And, um, and and just kind of think about what that does for the other person's day or, or just, um, their memories out there on the trails. Right. But I couldn't help, but get done with my run the other day and just think, you know, where, where's all the common courtesy gone these days? Like, I feel like a lot of that is lacking. I mean, forget about it on the drive home. That's a whole nother story with people texting and driving and Mm -hmm. not looking Mm -hmm. at what they're really doing and um, not allowing you to to get over when you have your blinker on for uh, the last minute and somebody doesn't want to let you over. I just had that happen, by the way, when I was trying to get onto the highway and we were at a stoplight and I had plenty of time, I thought, to get over. And this one guy just would not let me in. And I, 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 I finally had to just essentially go to a crawl where now the people in my lane behind me were all kind of waiting on me to be able to get right, in. Right. And then I ended up getting onto, uh, onto the highway. And then we just happened to get off at the same exit, this guy <laughs> and I, where now we're at the stoplight and we're just right next to each other. And I'm just uh-huh. looking over at him. And cause I was wondering really the whole time, like, what's the big deal just to let me in? Sure enough, he's on his phone. Oh no! You know, and he's uh, and I and I'm. I imagine he was probably on his phone while he was driving and didn't even look at my blinker or what was going on. Yep, yep. Well, you know, I uh, I'd like to wrap up this running rant. It turned into a driving. It turned into a driving rant. Just an overall rant. Yeah. Well, you are a cranky old man, Matthew. So I am. So that's the end of our first running rant. Yep. Yep. Do you feel uh, better? What's your running rant? No, I I feel worse. Now. <laughs> I feel worse, and now I'm angry. No, I just look um, one one step at a time. If uh, people listening, if 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 this is something you experience, I'd love to kind of hear what your running rants are, and and maybe just 
just becoming more aware with with all of us, right? Uh, athletes in yeah. our facility here, they actually sign a commitment on our wall in permanent ink um, where it says that they will not um, – they will not drink and drive. They will not text and drive. They will not uh, partake in distracted driving. If if somebody in the car is um, is driving and they are trying to get on their phone and text something, you offer to text for them. What do, uh, is there something I can text for you? But yeah. you know, again, that's that's a that's that's a part of I think the courtesy conversation we're having here. So um, uh, hopefully, you guys found that helpful or 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 you you um agree with what we're saying but yeah let's let's uh hear what you have to say about these running rants too now we'll talk about our overrated and underrated with um with with our topics we wanted to kind of go over what commonly we hear in now we'll talk about running okay so we're getting to the running part in a <laughs> And and in a less ranty way. All right, all right. Um, yeah. So so uh, so Joe D and Gary V was that his name? Mm-hmm. Um, so so Vander Chuck. They do these overrated, underrated things, and you know they pick these topics and say, okay, well this is um, you know overrated, and here's why, and and this is underrated, and here's why. Mm-hmm. And we thought we'd give that a shot as it pertains to running and strength training for runners. So this is our first stab at it, and. And if we like doing it and you like hearing it, um, we're going to ask you for suggestions. If you want to uh, find us on Instagram or Facebook and send us a message or a comment on something with your overrated or underrated thing that's been on your mind, or you can send us an email, uh, and that's at pendolatraining at gmail.com. And uh, give us some suggestions for overrated and or underrated things that we can discuss on the podcast. Yeah, man. Uh, so first thing is overrated. I think a very common topic in running is just volume. You know, how much, how many miles a week? And you're not talking about the volume on your headphones. <laughs> right, right. Don't have the volume too high on the headphones, right? That's uh, <laughs> that's over- way overrated. You, yeah, that's way overrated. You, you'll you have hearing problems like, like me. Although that came more from, you know, running a chainsaw for five years on the shot crew. Running with chainsaws? I, yeah, that- I, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't run with the chainsaw, but so with with volume, we want to take a look at what is um, the effective dosing, right? So how how much do you need to run when people go off of miles uh, per week? You know that that to me in itself can set us up for failure, or it can not necessarily it will, but it it can in that we're more concerned with getting in the goal mileage for that week, right? So I've got to hit 40 miles or 50 miles or 60 or 70 or whatever it is. And of course, things change for us. So lifestyle, um, what we need to be able to recover from plays a big part in this as well. So first of all, I tend to go more in minutes. So I might have more of a fractionalized approach to a lot of, especially my easy days. And we've talked about that before, where just the other day, I have a woodway here in the facility. So I ran for four minutes on the woodway. It's the curve, guys. So I am the engine, right? And I'm going with four minutes of running, which is a little bit harder on the curve. And then I go with a minute of dynamic movement, right? So knuckle draggers and just working on some of the um, the active uh, type of flexibility drills that I like to do for my hips, uh, so leg swings, et cetera. But I'll do a minute of that, get back on to the woodway and go another four minutes like that. So I did that for five rounds and that gives me a, less than a half an hour, but it definitely gave me the consistency in the week of what I needed to kind of repeat my skill set and my gait and my running and work and there, on. And, and there's no way, do you... Do you get to measure your mileage on the woodway? Yeah, you can. You can. You can, but, but I you don't weren't care. doing that. No. Okay. And I'm also just a side note, but I work uh, in days like that. I work much more on my breathing, so I'll run on the woodway, breathing out 
for three steps, breathing in for two steps, and just keeping a good rhythm on that particular day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say that the, the other factor that I like to try to think about is what kind of quality running are we doing? So I ran um, nine miles in the mountains the other day, and it took me 90 minutes. Um, and oh, like literally exactly 90 minutes and like four seconds. Okay. So it ended up being obviously 10 minute miles. Okay. Now that doesn't sound like it's very fast. That was one of the harder days that I did because of the, the amount of vertical that mm -hmm. I had to overcome that day, the, the hills, the mountains really that, that I was running. So point is that if I just log down nine miles, that doesn't equate at all to the effort it took and where my heart rate was averaging for for that type of a run. So I would rather log 90 minutes as part of my volume and then put my perceived effort as being about an eight. So that now scales it way up. Man, and it doesn't matter nearly as much that, my volume. That equation, I think, is brilliant if if. Uh, I don't want your head to get too big here, but that really does sound like a uh, a really um, efficient way to for anybody at any level to go. Okay, my perceived effort. If you haven't listened to our podcasts about rate of perceived effort, please go back and do that. We've got a couple of them uh, in the past here, um, but, where we explain what rate of perceived effort is. But doing that uh, equation with minutes and perceived effort, that seems like a better way to listen to how your body is uh, performing as well as recovering. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to the fractionalized approach, and especially if you're going off of heart rate or you're just monitoring your perceived effort, then it's you're more likely to take those minutes of walking or even power hiking on maybe some of the steeper parts without feeling like you just have to run the entire time. And I know it takes a little bit of leap of faith, but I can tell you going off of minutes and having a little bit more perspective about your perceived effort and rating that on a scale versus just looking at 40 miles or 50 miles or whatever you think the goal is for that week in your mileage, I think that you'll find, as I have, that your performance can really improve because now you are putting in a little bit more recovery coming off of days that you normally might just try to run through the entire session without stopping, without doing that fractionalized approach, without doing any dynamic movement. Your heart rate is now working, let's say, moderately hard on a day that should be really easy because we can get kind of addicted to the numbers and saying, well, I've got to finish five miles today versus I'm going to make sure that I improve my skill sets and my readiness today for my next main quality session. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of my perspective on volume. I think that volume is overrated, and I think that what's underrated is your perceived effort and, and minutes over yeah. miles. Yeah. yeah, that's a great coin right there. Great yeah, coin. I like that. Yep. Um, so you brought up one about the six pack. So oh, why don't yeah. you, uh, I know, I know you look at my six pack and you just get really envious and jealous. So I get it. Um, well, the, the, yeah, I mean, you only have a six pack. It's more like an eight pack. I, well, I have an 18 pack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people and sure, if you're, if your goal is aesthetics, you know, fine, whatever, but as as it pertains to uh, being a really functional human being and as it equates to being a better runner, um, you know, six, uh, six pack, it doesn't really equate to being a better runner. And so that, you know, you see the you see the models and you see people running and and or, or whatever and. Uh, it's all in a studio or it's got great lighting and it really enhances. They're probably even doing makeup in their abs so that, so that that's really popping out. Oh yeah. Photoshop is. <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah. 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 Uh, and so, you know, that, that, 
that I think is really overrated in a lot of senses. And I don't know how many people who are listening to this podcast uh, are trying to achieve something like that. But I would guess a lot of people, at least in the general public, are trying to achieve something like that at the expense of what is the underrated part of this coin, which is um, your true core or your trunk strength. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, this is where, again, I, I, I'll bring up that in the, in the past when I was much younger and I, I did some uh, modeling for a little bit and we talked about that the, 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 at the time, the goal was aesthetic, right, for pictures. Mm -hmm. And I probably aesthetically never looked better um, and I would not have been able to run anywhere near the performance levels I do now. Now, I run a little bit leaner as it is. First of all, a lot of people will probably look at if somebody has a six pack and automatically mean think that means that they have like really low body fat. Mm. You know, we and we, they must be really fit and they must be really fit. Right. Uh, we also hold fat in different places. Not all of us hold it in our midsection. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have under 10 percent body fat if you're a male and you can see your abs. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I pay more attention to is performance. And I can tell you when I was um, at about four and a half percent to five percent body fat, I was certainly picture ready, but not performance ready at all. And I, I operate really well myself at around 9%, 8% at the lowest probably body fat, which again, that's pretty lean. And I think that's leaner than most people realize because a lot of people would look at me right now and say that, oh, you must be around 5% body fat. No, yeah. that's like a bodybuilder on the stage. They're 5% or less. And it's quite honestly, pretty dangerous to be at that level, I think. And it's not, nothing to do with performance. Now on the performance side of things, though, when you say, um, about core strength, okay? And I say these things are for your core, right? These movements that we give in the program are for your core. They're for spinal tap, right? Mm -hmm. They're to work the muscles that are supporting your movement and giving you that stability through your trunk so that you have better mobility in your hips and your shoulders for running. So well, I think it's, too, it's also uh, good to point out a lot of people equate your abs with your core. And they stop right there. Right, right. Well, abs are cooked in the kitchen too, right? So we, we have to always bring in nutrition into this conversation. You can't uh, exercise a bad diet away. So obviously, really the first thing that people should be looking at when it comes to abs, if, that's, if it's important for you to get to that point where you can see them. And there's nothing wrong, by the way, with saying, I feel more better about myself. I feel more confident if I, if I like my aesthetics, right? So there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it's nutrition, 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 recovery and nutrition, right? Um, and recovery, obviously I give you a good example of that when I was working hundred hour weeks, getting this program together and ready. And I had to, you know, realistically I'd say, okay, I get a back off of my, my running and my training goals right now. And I got to dedicate this time towards this, putting this program out and it just working a hundred hours a week. There's, there's no way to, to really stay on top of your fitness at that point. Right. So I was getting a little less sleep than what was optimal. And the first thing I noticed is that I started storing a little bit more body fat, not a lot more, a little bit more. My nutrition is always pretty dialed in, but as I got less sleep for that time period, then I started craving more of the comfort foods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a real thing, obviously. And, you, and when you don't have as much sleep, your body will, you probably will crave more carbs. Your brain runs mainly off of carbs, so you're probably gonna crave more carbs in general, and especially, you know, quick carbs, right? So that's kind of yep. where we do want the potato chips, you know, the, the salty carbs and stuff like that. So, you know, for for me, that was, that there was a, a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm gonna do it until January 1st, and then I'm gonna get back to my, training goals, right? So that's what we, that's what I did. But I did, I did notice that 
Um, as, as good as my nutrition was because I wasn't sleeping very much, um, I was, it was harder for me to keep a good nutrition program going without wanting some more off foods, we'll say. And so one hand washes the other where you're getting out there and you're getting active, you're getting moving, you're probably going to want to eat cleaner fuels, things that are going to allow you to feel better, recover better. And in turn, you're probably going to see some of those aesthetics a little bit more, you know, so that's kind of the way I like to, to think of it. But I just I'll close this topic with this is. I have certainly worked with a lot of athletes that have they they have good genetics uh, for seeing their abs, okay? Um, and I've had plenty of really I'm talking about even elite athletes that you don't see a whole lot of definition there, and there's there is nothing wrong with somebody who who is not as lean and is performing the at a very high level that that to me is part of the relative conversation so mm-hmm. in other words i do believe that some people again hold body fat in different places so just because they can't see their abs but look at their legs their legs might look just shredded right it just like man they're so lean there so their their body's just putting that fat around their midsection a little bit more but they're performing very very optimally so they're not by any means overweight but they're just not going to necessarily look like the other person they're racing against and yet they're both like neck to neck you know trying to uh trying to uh, PR or something and, and it comes down to the line. So it shows that both athletes are kind of optimal for their, uh, for their bodies and, 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 um, and, and their running economy, right? So there's no one set answer to that, but I'd like to just make sure that people do understand that it really comes down to how much you've done to, to create that core control because your hips do the steering when you run. And that's what I think of as core control. Have you done some really good work to increase the stability um, for in the, in the core for the mobility in the hips and the shoulders. And that's the performance side of it that matters most. So when you talk about somebody who does like a lot of sit-ups or crunches or basically abdominal flexion type mm-hmm, of work, mm-hmm. but they're in, and that muscle, that abdominal rectus abdominis, abdominis, that's going to, it's a muscle. So it's going to grow and you might even with a little bit higher body fat, you might still see those muscles kind of popping out because they, they grow too, right? Yeah. That, that could be highly dysfunctional because that person may be doing nothing for their lateral line. They mm-hmm. may be doing nothing really for their obliques, for, you know, these, uh, the quadratus lumborum, uh, all the stabilizers that are necessary to really steer the hips properly. So don't think just because somebody has, um, a six pack that that makes them a, a good athlete, right? Six pack overrated, uh, trunk, the entire trunk underrated. Yeah, man. That's so where we are. we're going to, we're going to pick up some more overrated, underrated topics in the next podcast, guys. Hope you like this one again, Chad, where can they find us if they want to send us an overrated, underrated? Ooh. And we also are going to give a book away. We're going to give a book away. You are going to give a book away. Oh, uh, man. Go Gwen, go. Go Gwen, go. Je- Gwen Jorgensen, who, if you haven't listened to that uh, episode where we interviewed Gwen, definitely take a listen to that. But Gwen, has uh, been a client of mine for uh, a while now, and she's uh, just actually quali- hit her Olympic qualifying time for the 5,000 meters. She right. ran 15.08 the other night. Congratulations, Gwen. Yeah, Gwen she's is, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so this book that we're giving away is was written by her mother and her sister. And it was about their uh, about Gwen's journey to becoming an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, it's a great, great book, and uh, we got a copy here. We're going to give away. And if you want a chance to win this book, uh, go ahead and uh, either email us at pendolatraining at gmail dot com, or give us a DM at our Instagram or Facebook, which is Pendola Project, and uh, give us your best overrated. Uh, and or underrated topic and we'll choose what we like the best and and that winner will get a copy of this book we'll send it out to you that's right and gwen by the way was kind enough to donate a dozen books 
to the podcast. So this, uh, these books also are personally signed by her and, um, she's, she's, um, very generous to, to do that. So thank you for that, Gwen. And you guys, if you haven't read the book, it's, um, it's one of my favorites. We also actually had a book review with the authors, which is her mother and sister, also on the podcast. Those previous podcasts were part of the Pandola Project podcast, but you can still access those. Just um, just go back a couple months and you'll see those podcasts. Sure will. All right, folks. Well, we'll see you again someday. <laughs> <laughs>